So thank you for your patience. Let's go ahead and drop in now and meditate. Do about uh, maybe 35, 40 minutes sit today with both guidance and quiet time. So find a comfortable seat. And I'll guide you through a relaxation practice called the Nine Relaxation Breaths as a way to land in meditation. First, just breathing deeply into your belly and releasing any kind of extraneous tension with the out breath. Making sure you're in a position that feels comfortable. Feeling the breath in the body. It might be the first time you've done that all day. And we'll begin with a few breaths, three breaths or so, breathing into the physical layer, any physical tension in your body, breathing into that tension, and then with the out breath release, feel that physical tension melting down into the earth beneath you. And then with the next three breaths, breathe into any emotional tension. Feel where you might be holding emotional tension in the body. Feel that. Breathe into it and release with the out breath. And with your next three breaths, breathe into any mental tension, any thoughts, worries, concerns. Feel where you hold mental tension in your body. Breathe into it. And then release with the out breath. Feel that mental tension releasing into the earth beneath you. Take a moment now to give rise to a heartfelt motivation of bodhicitta for the benefit of all beings we practice. Now soothing the body with the breath, we'll spend some time with mindfulness of breathing as an anchor, as a platform, a foundation for our practice. Concentration, a focus, an attentive awareness is key to any meditation practice. So let's really start off on the right foot. Feel the inflow of the breath as we breathe in, entering the body, the lungs, the diaphragm descending, the belly expanding. And then with the out breath, the opposite, the diaphragm coming up, the air leaving the lungs, the breath traveling out of the nasal passageway. Stay with the full arc of the breath. 
let the awareness alight upon the breath like a horse and its rider. Releasing tension with the out-breath, releasing distraction with the out-breath. And internally count from 1 to 21 as a way to cultivate concentration and relaxation. Feel your awareness descend fully into the body, inhabiting the global experience of being in the body with the breath. Now maintain mindfulness of breathing, but let go of the counting. Coming home to the moment, releasing distraction as you notice let it release back into the space from which it came, like clouds in the sky dissolving back into the sky. You can practice with the eyes open or closed now. If the eyes are open, you can take your glasses off and let the eyes be at a downcast, comfortable angle, softening the eyes. Feel the body relaxed, releasing tension. These common areas of tension are the, the third eye, or the jaw. Let the jaw go slack and the brow relax. Also the muscles around and behind the eyes soften. A feeling of awe, of astonishment washing over your face. The chin drawn in slightly, the back of the skull perched yet not compressed upon the occiput, the top of the spine. Relax the shoulders, and let that feeling mount all the way down through the body. Unwind, unravel, 
the day's worries and tensions, let it go. Give yourself the presence of this moment now. Whatever you find in this meditative space, welcome at home. If you're bored, welcome home boredom. If you're tired, welcome home tired. If you're distracted, welcome home distracted. And so on. Heartbreak, anger, doubt. Whatever you find, welcome at home again and again. And release the busyness, the distraction with the out-breath and stay home, stay home the breath in the body. And your mind vast like the sky, clear, limpid like a blue sky. Don't let it be dull and dark and clouded. See if you can brighten, even internally, turn up the dial of luminosity and cultivate that.
times you welcome things home, at times you let them dissolve back into the space from which they came. Try them both. There's a turning in and a coming in to the core with the welcoming home. Then there's a dissipation and a simple cutting loose with the mm, dissolving. Feel the difference between the two. One's not better than the other. They're good tools and ways that we can learn for ourselves how to work with the mind and emotions. Some are easily liberated, a natural liberation back into space. Others need more tending and more welcoming home. Discern for yourself what is needed in the moment for you. To come to greater wholeness, concentration, stability, joy, equanimity, this peacefulness. And once you find it, claim it. As they say, capture the citadel of awareness. Once you land there, then don't let it just putter away. Claim it, guard it, but with love and strength and clarity and rest there. Hold that samadhi. A luminous awareness. And within this space, everything is welcome. It's a big open space.
And now I invite you to spend some time practicing Donglen. You, those of you, I think most of us, perhaps all, have been here many times before. You know that the Donglen can take a personal angle or working with others in our lives or even the broader global community, people who are suffering, animals, beings, not just humans. You can choose to work with yourself, with a loved one, with a neutral person, so-called enemy, or even groups of people, a country, for example, Ukraine, or uh, Sudan, Ethiopia, other places around the world, people, groups that you know of who need care and prayer. I'm going to let you free roam here, spending time as long as you want in any of those domains, maybe traversing a few within the next 10-15 minutes as you like. You can start with self if you want or not. Just feel what's needed in your life, in your sphere, in your consciousness right now. Breathing in the hardship, breathing out the remedy, coordinated with the flow of the breath. If you wish, using the texture of a smoky vapor drawing in and a cool, clear healing light moving out with the out breath. And let's begin the Donglen, sending and receiving compassion practice. And if you've never been here before, intuit it. Just breathing in that which you would normally push away. Breathing out that which you would normally keep for yourself. Developing greater capacity for compassion, empathy. Use the breath. Release distraction with the out-breath. Stay with the breath in this meditation. A simple metaphor is bringing, breathing in the illness, transform it at the heart space, and breathing out the medicine, offering it to yourself or others.
We'll end with some chanting of the mantra Om Mani Padme Hum. Feel free to join whenever you like or listen. It's a mantra of compassion. You can imagine the sounds carrying blessings and prayers for the well-being and healing and safety of beings all over the world. Om Mani Padme Hum Mani Padme Hum Om Mani Padme Hum Om Mani Padme Hum Om Mani Padme Hum Mani Padme Hum Om Mani Padme Hum Om Mani Padme Hum Oh, Mani Padme Ho, oh, 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 Mani Padme Ho, Oh, Mani Padme Ho, Oh, Mani Padme Ho, Oh, Mani Padme Ho, oh, 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 Mani Padme Ho, Oh, Mani Padme Ho, Oh, Mani Padme Ho. Oh, Mani Padme Ho, oh, 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 Mani Padme Ho, Oh, Mani Padme Ho, Oh, Mani Padme Ho, Oh, Mani Padme Ho, oh, 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 Mani Padme Ho, Oh, Mani Padme Ho, Oh, Mani Padme Ho. Oh, Mani Padme Ho, oh, 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 Mani Padme Ho, Oh, Mani Padme Ho, oh, oh, Mani Padme Ho, Oh, Mani Padme Ho, oh, 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 Mani Padme Ho, Oh, Mani Padme Ho, oh, oh, Mani Padme Ho. Oh, Mani Padme Ho, oh, 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 Mani Padme Ho, Oh, Mani Padme Ho, Oh, Mani Padme Ho, Oh, Mani Padme Ho, oh, 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 Mani Padme Ho, Oh, Mani Padme Ho, Oh, Mani Padme Ho. Oh, Mani Padme Ho, oh, 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 Mani Padme Ho, Oh, Mani Padme Ho, Oh, Mani Padme Ho, Oh, Mani Padme Ho, oh, 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 Mani Padme Ho, Oh, Mani Padme Ho, Oh, Mani Padme Ho. Dedicate the merit of our practice for the benefit of all. Thank you. It's so nice to know that some people are practicing in the space. I hope uh, I hope it felt good <laughs> being there and being here all at the same time. I know as people start feeling more ready to be in rooms together, that will be such a great refuge. I know many already are. Uh, it's interesting to feel that shift and changing of opening, but not yet. <laughs> Kind of a little hesitancy out there in the world. So let's open it up for questions, comments, observations, and and then we can spend some time with this chapter of the Hermit again.
And if there's nothing, then we can just dive in. Remind me to end at 8.30, not 9 tonight. <laughs> Claudia, yes. Uh, Chandra, maybe we could start a discussion with, before yeah. you before you arrived, uh, mm -hmm. I was talking with some of the uh, uh, fellows, the uh, colleagues, or I don't know how, my friends, <laughs> the, yes. the, the, sang, <laughs> the sangha. sangha. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah about how I felt a little um, ambivalent and uh, uh, if you want a little conflicted, well, not ambivalent rather, about the hermit because um, mm -hmm. uh, Eve uh, read some passages of that chapter last week. And I of course understand that it is very important to get out of this uh, treadmill in real life and, and take refuge and take take time to be in this space, you know, to reflect yeah. and and become hopefully better human beings. Uh, but maybe I misunderstood. I felt like, yes, it's good to to take refuge and, and be a hermit for a while, but my take was that we're trying to become better bodhisattvas and that the real test of how much we have grown or learned the Buddhist principles mm -hmm. is out in the world, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. of, of like dealing with difficult relationships or challenges, whatever it is. And yeah. so I'd like to hear like, I mean, yeah. if you could elaborate on that a little bit. I mean, mm -hmm. I feel like it's important to find a balance Mm -hmm. But uh, what is it that I didn't get? <laughs> Maybe I guess that, or yeah, I don't it's know. A... yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great point. I'm glad you're kind of calling out the elephant in the room. You know, as I read the chapter, I had a feeling that a question like this would arise if it hadn't already last week, and it arises for me too, Claudia. <laughs> it's also I, I'm with you to a certain extent we're in a different era than a lot of these quotations were written, different culture. And so sometimes it can feel like it's not quite speaking to me, you know, there could be like a modern interpretation of these quotes would be nice commentary. I mean, that's what Eve and I are trying to do. But you have to come to class to get that and maybe or, or do it on your own. And with your alone with the book. So you know, Tibet was such a devoted Buddhist culture and country and still is, still is, but for hundreds and hundreds of years. And they really internalized the the contemplative life as the pinnacle more than material or even family ties, which is not all, not all of them did, but a lot of the Dharma teachings, not just Tibetan, but also whether it's Thai or Indian or Burmese or Korean or Japanese or Chinese, you know, Sri Lankan, um, all around Southeast Asia. Um, a lot, not all, because some are different, but a lot of the, what we have inherited and what's in this book too, but also the Vipassana movement all came down from monastics. And so they're speaking... I'm often like, yeah, this is the monastic. Like when I open books like this, I put on my monastic hat. <laughs> like the, the person, the monastic in me, that that has done retreat or that would like to do more retreat or maybe did in past lives <laughs> and have kind of a a distant memory or nostalgia for that life. <laughs> But when I think of going into a long-term retreat and sealing the cave wall, the door, uh, it scares me right now. You know, I don't think I could do it. I couldn't do it. Uh, and I think that's a part of my, um, you know, I'm still got a child. I'm still in, very much in the world. But it's also the orientation of this modern fast-paced life is so in the opposite direction that uh, it, it, it's a big momentum to turn back on and undo to go into these retreats, unlike it was in 17th, 18th, 19th century Tibet, you know. 
And so uh, I think you're right, Claudia, that the sh- that balance is key. So what my teacher says, Lama Tsultram, is try to carve out time every year for retreat. Uh, and then if you ever have circumstances where you can do like really long-term retreat, go for it. Because there's nothing like retreat. Uh, there's nothing like retreat. And it really brings the teachings alive in you. And you've all these things that st- are staying cerebral when we're, or somewhat cerebral when we're in the world trying to understand it, come alive in us in a way that we can't even imagine when we're in longer-term retreat. And I'm talking like three months, six months, a year, but also a couple weeks. So what she likes to have her kind of, you know, more core students do is, or her and her authorized teachers and so on, is to commit to doing a month a year. And it doesn't have to be all at the same time, but it can be like a week here, a week there. If you have children, she lets you do a week here, a week there. <laughs> but ideally all at once or in two two two-week segments. And uh, it's not always easy, but I I try to do that. I get close. Last year was about a a month altogether. More like, you know, three and a half weeks, but that's, that was, and it was really time well spent. This year, not so much. Um, But I think that as a bodhisattva, the the key is to be able to come out of the cave or off the mountain or out of the monastery and be in the world and and do good work, you know, be of service. And that is also what happens in Tibet. Like, for example, Dilgo Kensi Rinpoche did 12 years of retreat. And often often people by that time don't want to come out of retreat (laughs) because they've tasted the bliss of, of the simple life, nature, living in nature slowing down and seeing the insanity of the world out there on a certain level. But his teacher said, it's time for you to come out and you need to teach. You need to benefit beings. That's your main purpose. And that's a common story. So it might be after just a few years, like three-year retreats are pretty standard with the Lama. You know, often people will go into a three- or three-month retreat. Um, Twelve years is not uncommon in Tibet. But after that, they're still alive and kicking, you know, so come out and help. So for us, like even His Holiness the Dalai Lama says, I remember in a teaching at a Kala Chakra Empowerment once, he said, for those Westerners, because there's a fair amount of Westerners who live in India part of the year and really devote themselves to spiritual life. They found that's how they can do it because India's got such a, most of the culture, whether it's within a Tibetan refugee settlement in India or India, you know, Indian communities uh, also are so oriented towards spiritual life that it's easier to focus there. And that was my finding when I lived there, that probably people here on the call who have lived abroad or lived in other contemplative-oriented cultures or Buddhist cultures or so on, religious, more spiritual cultures, it's just easier when there's that, that supportive network. And here it's hard. It's hard here. It is hard here. So what His Holiness the Dalai Lama said is try to do six months in India and six months in the U.S. or Europe or wherever you're from so that you see your family, you work if you can. You know, you can do that kind of lifestyle where you put some money in the bank and then go into retreat again in India. You know, if you've got a little apartment or a cabin or you stay stay in a monastery, he felt that the six months and six months was a good balance, equal. And it conti- contributed to kind of integration and healthy mental states, emotional states, for Westerners, because we're not so used to that extreme solitude. So balance, balance, balance. Yeah. Is that helpful, Claudia? Yeah. Is that good? Yeah. And, and then we'll get to a couple of these um, quotations from this chapter and maybe we'll tease out a little bit more of that on a subtle level because there's this subtle retreat and I know Eve spoke about it in terms of time but we can also think of it in terms of space right inner outer space and secret space <laughs> but I see another hand so I'd love to, to hear from, from others too thank you go ahead I was uh, I'm, I'm chiming in from a day of taking a day off and being a hermit today. Oh, great. Because um, I'm 
just experiencing a lot. You know, whenever I, I'm in the process of grieving my dad, he's still alive, but he's dying. Mm. And that's, it's, it's like, I had to really carve it out. I had to like tell everyone I'm going into a day off and um, it's, it's very difficult in our culture to, to, um, to do that. And then to, once I'm in that space of like, okay, I, I'm not working today. Then, you know, I just was writing in my journal, how the, the instinct to do is so strong and I just needed a day off, you know? And so I actually finally got to the point where I, I really rested and this is, you know, very lovely. And I also this year took a break for seven days. I took a seven day retreat and, um, total silent on a desert island. Mm -hmm. And I learned in that, that was my first long retreat. Mm -hmm. And I just, I'm, I'm beginning to understand the hermit because it's, it's a rejuvenative. It's very much like once you're a practitioner, you need that, you know, you start, it's, it's almost like it, it takes, it takes you up another level or it, I don't know, it's hard for me to describe. So I'm looking forward to the discussion because I feel like I'm just beginning to be able to take the time I need and not be not feel guilty about it right that's the other part is like oh i i feel like i'm cutting out i'm not um i'm somehow not participating and then i feel left out and then i because every time I, I i go away into my my retreat i come out feeling like all oh, this has happened and i'm not part of it you know so i i do look forward to some consultation about coming in and out of retreat you know, yes a very difficult thing very difficult Thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad to hear that you, you know, you knew you followed your instinct and knew to take some time for yourself and to mourn your father's transitioning. I'm sure that's not an easy thing to do. And also not easy to take the time and to carve out the world, tell everybody, look, I'm not replying. <laughs> I'm not responding create your boundary. And that's what retreat in Tibetan literally means is boundary. It's hum. The word in English is funny in a way. It has so many different meanings. It's different. In Tibetan, it's tsam, T-S-A-M, T-S-A-M, tsam, tsam. And it means boundary. And so they talk about retreat as setting outer, inner, and secret boundaries. And I think it was clever and interest good that Eve talked about time as an aspect of that, because it is time is also a way that we can claim our tsum, our boundaries. Right? We claim this time. This is our tsum, even though I broke the tsum. I was a little late. <laughs> but this is our time. Um, so yeah, and coming in and out of the tsam, right? So there's there's little prayers and rituals that, that we do in the Tibetan tradition of entering into the tsam and leaving the tsam so that it helps in that kind of sealing the kind of psychic space also, but also the cabin or whatever it is. And then um, then breaking down that boundary when it's time to come out, opening that feeling of opening again to the world so that it's an integral transition and gradual and not kind of unconscious or too abrupt but then there then there's the whole like literally driving off the mountain into the world and the hallucinatory effect that that can be or coming off your island uh, with the bustling world and this people speaking so quickly and rushing around it's it's really um i find it um it's easier now but when i was younger and starting just starting to do more retreat and feeling that dramatic contrast it's uh it's actually really sad it can be sad coming out of retreat because there's so much joy that we find in retreat and then when we come out we realize what how how much has been lost in our modern culture and then and then then our slowness starts to speed up and speed up and speed up and then before we know it we're in the river again with everybody else and it can be quite dramatic my friend did a three-year three-month retreat in a cabin at Taramandala and quite a few years after that I was chatting with her I said how was 
that for you? And how is coming out of retreat? And she said it took her about the same length of time to feel normal again, like in the world, be really capacitated in the world. So three and a half years to really get her feet on the ground and feel okay in the world. And, and that's that's difficult to hear. You know, it makes me wonder if that type of dramatic long retreat is good for people like us. And I'm not going to say it isn't, but I think that you're right, Jason. Integration is key there. And having tools and practices that we can do in retreat so that we stay integrated and we don't just get get high and spiritual bypassing our work, our shadow work that we need to do. That's why Feeding Your Demons, Lama Tsultram always tells people, do Feeding Your Demons in retreat. And I forgot that, and about two weeks in, I was hitting some shadows. <laughs> I was shadow boxing. <laughs> and I was like, oh, Feeding Your Demons, I did it. Of course. Perfect retreat tool. Help me move right through, get the wisdom from it, heal it, feel better for it. Like, So having tools in the retreat and then also after and out of the retreat. Yeah. And then we'll, yeah, let, we could go into these and keep these, these questions and comments in the air with these quotes. But it, before I do that, anyone else? Anything up right now? Chandra, can there we, is in the chat. Can uh, yeah. there is Denise Williams? Can we practice this somehow in daily meditation? That's her her question. Yes, yes, and I like this in terms of the tsum, the whole idea of tsum, because we can set boundaries in daily life when we're with our family or friends or work. And so I want to talk about that. Um, that's one way we bring it in. Of course, breathing, coming home to the moment in the breath, even practicing Tonglen on the go in the car, in a movie theater, or wherever you are in your day. It, absolutely. I mean, that is really true integration, is having morning, noon, and night be your, be in a, in a state of awareness. There's a great quote that, that speaks to that. Which, which, where is it? Yeah. This 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 uh, quote from one eighty five, page one eighty five, by Latsun Namkai Jigme. Latsun Namkai Jigme is the second poem on that page. We're doing, of course, on the path to enlightenment on the path to enlightenment for those who are online or watching the YouTube video later. This is our book for the book study. And we're on page 185. So he starts pet, which is that seed syllable, P-H-E-T or P-H-A-A-T, which is like a cutting through. It's almost like an onomatopoeia word, you know, part. It's a cut through delusion, the fog, cut through to clarity. So he starts the poem with put. If you want to really practice the teaching, you must not depend on anything or anyone. Okay, so this reminded me of retreat. You know, when you're in retreat, you've got all your books, you've got your notes from your teachers, maybe your podcasts, what you've gathered, what you've heard, but it really becomes time to practice it and to let it come alive in you. And in that way, you're depending on yourself 100% when you're in retreat, right? Like, you can depend on other people at certain points um, leading up to retreat when you get out of retreat. But when you've sealed those that door and cut, you know, turn off the cell phone, uh, if you, it's, he's saying if you want to really practice the teaching, you must not depend on anything or anyone. So it becomes really, really personal here. If you want to have real diligence, eradicate the last trace of attachment to yourself. This is also like, oh my God, what? So if you really want to, if you want to have real diligence, eradicate the last trace of attachment to yourself. So it's like you're a, it's like you're a, a hound dog 
and you're you're able to sniff the little even most subtle um, smells of ego <laughs> the stinky smells of your ego fixation and clinging the attachment to your self as something that should be defended or cultivated or perfected I am Chandra and I'm on the mountaintop doing my meditation retreat this type of I I I often they say in the teachings that uh, that that we should recognize uh, that often suffering comes from the grasping at the sense of I meaning self and mine like what belongs to me I and mine, I and mine is everywhere in the in the teaching especially Dzogchen talks a lot about I and mine the grasping at I and mine and so being really diligent if you want to have real diligence you're 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 constantly sniffing out when those things arise I recently had um, an opportunity to see a defended no, oh you know I felt it sort of wrongly accused went through the looping of the eye and mine you know well, I didn't do that oh my god what are these people thinking oh what happened oh I feel so horrible my oh my god you know <laughs> I've got to prove them wrong you know it's kind of bad you know a big misunderstanding and yes there needs to be clarification but first the work that needs to be done is like oh there's suffering here because there's an I here there's the ego that feels like it needs to be defended and then the mind you know whether it's my property or my people or my my image mine I and mine so if you want to have real diligence he says eradicate the last trace of attachment to yourself another way of understanding that is be diligently aware, diligently aware of the self grasping onto I and mine you could even this could be like a lojong slogan like when you're really stuck in a knot of suffering if you could remember not I not mine and see what that does to you for you with you with the you that doesn't exist <laughs> Okay, the next one is, if you want to have real pure vision, see the teacher in all things. I love this. This is kind of getting to what, what Denise asked. Can't we practice out in the world somehow? Well, yes, the real uh, pure vision, which is like, is a thing in tantras, like having pure vision, like really seeing all appearances and all beings as luminous expressions of the ground of being, you know, that's pure vision, not just reifying people as things, you know, objects as things and people as others. They're really seeing through pure vision what's beneath the veils and seeing into the nature of how things really are, which is beautiful, and luminous and blissful. So having that pure vision, he says, if you want to have real pure vision, see the teacher in all things, so then all things become our teacher. Even those criticisms <laughs> even the attacks on the ego those are the greatest teachers right we've learned through our lojong slogans that to really value the so-called enemy above the buddha because it's those people who teach us patience and then also help to break down the false sense of self i and mine so then we we're grateful so see the teacher in all things. That's about bringing the practice into daily life, right? Whether you're in the mountaintop talking to the birds and seeing the birds as your teachers or down on Market Street, you know, with all hundreds of other people walking up and down the street, you know, all of them in some way have something to give, have something to teach us. And look for that, see that. That's pure vision, recognizing there's no mistakes, even the worst things, you know? Even the hardest things to bear have something to teach. So what is that? Then the next line, if you want to have real inner calm, maintain it day and night. So again, 
day and night, not just on the cushion. Day and night. So meditation, post-meditation, blending those experiences so that your whole day becomes a long session. And then into the night, you know, there's all these teachings on dream yoga where not only is it like trying to be mindful after the sun sets, but also like as you drop into sleep, can you maintain a certain degree of awareness so that when you transition from the waking state into the deep dream state, you don't lose consciousness. Now that is maverick, (laughs) you know, that is advanced. And that is a practice that some people might have a natural acuity with, even modern day people living in cities and so on. But in my experience, retreat is where you can really start to play more with that because you get quiet. Life is simpler. You're not as exhausted. And the dream states become more accessible and you can become lucid in the dream. If you if you lost your consciousness, which most of us will as we're falling asleep, the, the first real step is to learn how to become lucid in the dream and there are all sorts of cool teachings and books on that you know little tricks like look down at your hand or (laughs) in any case um so then you're then then when you become lucid in a dream like people might be saying well what does that have to do with buddhism and enlightenment well if you become lucid in the dream it teaches you how appearances are expressions of your own mind And then you can start to warp and change and choose what you do in the dream. A nightmare can become a fun dream, or you can start to fly, or you can cultivate qualities that you're trying to cultivate in your life. My old mentor, Alan Wallace, does a lot of dream, lucid dreaming, and he'll solve problems, write things, learn languages. Like he, like you can do stuff like that in the dream body. Apparently, it's you're you're much smarter. I haven't gotten to that place, but other people do who have committed themselves to this. So that's what they mean day and night, and also seeing all appearances like a dream. Then we bring that awareness, that realization, those insights that we have in lucid dreaming into the waking state, and we see the waking state for what it is, which is also a dream. So then we're blending day and night practice. Here's a comment, Chandra. Okay. Uh, from Paul Thomas. Uh-huh. Uh huh. So true. It's not time on the cushion. It's all your time off the cushion that is learning time. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's sometimes I feel like that's yeah. Of course, balance, like Claudia said, we need to have, um, we need to meditate in order to really have a meditative post meditation you know like there's no post meditation without meditation like we need time on the cushion but as westerners i think that the the real edge is then take that and really breathe it into your life because really we have no choice (laughs) we have to do it this way (laughs) most of us Um, yeah if you want to have real insight let whatever you perceive dissolve in awareness If you want to have real insight, let whatever you perceive dissolve in awareness. So insight is not just a random term. It is insight. It's vipassana. What is vipassana? What is insight in Buddhism? You know? What does it mean? to have insight in the Buddhist vernacular. You can type it in or unmute yourself. Okay, yeah, you've got your hand raised, please. Tanya? Yeah, I would would say um, emptiness, understanding emptiness. Ding, you got it. That's it. I want everyone to know that. Good job, Tanya. Yeah, vipassana literally means clear seeing or deep insight, profound insight. But what are we inciting into? Emptiness. We are seeing into emptiness. So in Buddhism, when you hear the word insight, you you should know. 
Insight means seeing into the nature of reality, seeing the empty, nature, interdependent nature of reality. And so it's so brilliant what he says here. He's talking about this insight, not as an intellectual practice, but from a contemplative perspective. From a, He's speaking as a meditator, right? Because that's what the hermits are. The awesome thing about hermits is they're, they're the yogis, you know. They're not just talking about this stuff. They feel it. They've experienced it. And what he's saying is, to have real insight, let whatever you perceive dissolve in awareness. That is the visceral, authentic, experiential uh, realization of emptiness. When you see everything that you're perceiving, even the sound of my voice right now, dissolving it back into emptiness. Yeah, I see Sylvia and Gina got it. <laughs> uh, the rest of you probably did too. You know, the teaching is of the bell. Let's all do a bell meditation. We perceive the sound and, pers and follow it back into emptiness and see the empty nature of this object, the sound, and your ears, all of those are interrelated. There's no solidly existing thing out there creating the sound. We are all collaborating to experience the perception of sound. Just as the sound dissolves back into emptiness, also our thoughts dissolve back into emptiness. So that is, there you have a direct experience of emptiness. It's not just an intellectual e exercise. That's true insight. And then the last line here, if you want to stabilize your calm, if you want to stabilize your calm, shamatha, and insight, vipassana, or vipassana in Sanskrit. Stop discriminating between mind and movement and mind at rest. Stop discriminating between mind and movement and mind at rest. He says, again, if you want to stabilize your shamatha, your calm, and your insight, your vipassana, stop discriminating between mind and movement and mind in a, at rest. So again, bring it, bring it into the world, you know. Can we, can we have the peace or the equanimity in the stillness and in the movement? It, it's like the backdrop of the mind is still, and then the, the rising and passing of thoughts and karmas, you know, the bubblings up of memories and so on. That's movement, but they're not separate. Like the rays of the sun and the sun, or the waves and the water of the ocean, right? They're not separate. They're not the same, but they're not separate. And in that sense, don't discriminate or discern, um, make a distinction between mind and movement and mind at rest. Meaning, also don't prefer one over the other. Yeah? Like, oh, I'm so distracted, it's so bad. Well, it's actually not. It's just movement. It's the mind in movement. We change the relationship to our thoughts. Thoughts aren't a problem. The space isn't the good and the thoughts aren't the bad. They're all creative displays of awareness. So he says that that's how you stabilize both Shamatha and Vipassana. Also, Shamatha is kind of like the emptying out of the mind. And then Vipassana is often more of an inqu inquiry, an active meditative thing. So that's why he's saying both the stillness of the Shamatha and then the movement or the, of the insight, they're not separate. And, and it's true, often we teach Shamatha Vipassana as two sequential things, but actually they, they 
they're not. You know, with the shamatha, we have the insight. The insight brings shamatha. The, the, really, it's a shamatha vipassana. That could be one word when it really starts cooking. Yeah. And then Shapkar on page 184, this is the other poem I... Oh, it's time! <laughs> oh, you guys! Help me, help me! I'm breaking uh, all the rules. Tum, tum, tum. Didn't we actually start at 7.15? We did. I don't know if people need to go. I could keep... Can oh, we get, I don't want to keep people past what we... What the cutoff of when they expect it to be done, though. You know, what do you think we should do, Claudia? I'm open to either. Well, I, I thought that we do an hour and a half, so I thought that maybe we would go to 8.45. Uh-huh. I can. Which is eight minutes. Do other people okay. want to do that? Thumbs up? All right. Is that okay? Okay. Shabkar, 184. Wondrous, remaining in lucid serenity, the state of sky-like evenness. Joyous, when day or night, indoors or outdoors, eyes open or closed, makes no difference to your awareness. Wondrous, when the world of form appears like a rainbow, in the unchanging sky of the absolute dimension. Joyous to dredge the depths of samsara, bringing all beings to enlightenment. All you, you whose wisdom is vast as the sky, that's meaning you, brilliant as the unobscured sun, limpid as crystal, firm as unshakable mountain, to you I pay homage and go for refuge. Grant me the waves of your grace. Yeah. So I yeah, when well, I pointed all of you, but I know what he's saying. All you whose wisdom is that's all of his gurus, you know. So he's asking for blessings. He's so devoted to his teachers, Shavkar. His book is amazing. You know, if anyone says that Buddhists aren't devotional, you can say, No, they are, <laughs> especially the Tibetans and Shavkar is takes the cake. He was a great one. Um, you can tell by his poetry and spontaneous songs of realization. He was sort of considered to be uh, an incarnation of Milarepa because he would spontaneously go into song just upon meeting people on the path or on the, mount on the mountain or in the town. So... I love this because he's celebrating the luminosity, the joy, the wonder of the world, um, remaining in lucid serenity, the state of sky-like evenness. So we've talked a lot about the sky and how it relates to the experience of spaciousness and the nature of mind. It's like the sky. Yeah. A joyous when day or night, indoors or outdoors, eyes open or closed make no difference to your awareness. It's true, awareness is pervading no matter what's happening, whether you're asleep or awake, eyes open or closed. Awareness is shining like the sun always shines, whether we can see it or not. And that's so joyful. And then wondrous when the world of form appears like a rainbow in the unchanging sky of the absolute dimension. Yes, like all appearances are like rainbows, appearing yet empty of solidity. Yeah. The sound of the bell, the picture on the wall. It seems so solid, but if you were to take a, if you were a quantum physicist, you would know. You'd be like, yeah, that's, there's more space in that mirror than there is or in that curtain or in that wall, then there is mol solid molecules, atoms. Aren't we? I looked this up. We are 99.999% space. We, human beings, are flesh and bone. We have so much space with it. Yes. Yeah, I don't know how that works, but it works. <laughs> it works in meditation, that's for sure. You know, when we say blend awareness with space, that's actually not so far out. You don't have to go out to the sky to blend with space. You are space. Space is all through you. Yeah. 
Then how joyous to dredge the depths of samsara, bringing all beings to enlightenment. So yes, the bodhisattva is about you know helping on the ground, like Tara, Arya Tara, noble mother Tara. She has her uh, right leg is stepping out into samsara, saying, I'm here, I'm on the ground with you. And then the left leg is tucked in close to her body, saying, but I'm also stabilized in nirvana. I am blissed out in my central channel, right? So I'm centralized, and then I'm also activated in the world. And so, yes, joy is to dredge the depths. We dredge the depths. Whether it's the depths of our own samsara, meaning our own psyche, and really bringing things to fruition and healing and pulling them the weeds up, you know, <laughs> um, dredging the depths of the ocean of samsara within us and around us in some way, helping to bring all beings to enlightenment. And then again, all th- all you whose wisdom is as vast as the sky, basically is bowing to his teachers. All of those who have bestowed wisdom upon me, given me Dharma teachings, brilliant as the unobscured sun, limpid as crystal, firm as an unshakable mountain. To you I pr- pay homage and go for refuge. Grant me the waves of your grace. This is such a sweet way of translating the waves of your grace because uh, the Tibetan word for blessings or waves of grace is another way of saying it is uh, Jinlap, Jinlap. You can spell it J-I-N-L-A-B, Jinlap. And Jin uh, means uh, blessings, and Lap means waves. So blessing waves. That's what blessings are. They're waves of energy, aren't they? And you feel them. My hair just stood on end. (laughs) I can feel it. So he translated this, grant me these Jinlap the waves of your blessings. So we receive that from our teachers, whether they're in real, you know, alive still, or even no longer in physical bodies, we can pray to them and ask for their blessings. You know, who knows where they are? Maybe they've already taken rebirth, but, you know, we can pray for blessings near and far. Um, Certain people can really bestow those blessings. I mean, have you ever been hugged by Amaji? been hugged once she's my 15th tara by the way i'm writing that chapter right now it's so beautiful it's so neat to read her life story she she first started by um hugging people when she was a child when she saw the poverty around her village and she would take them clothes and food from her family home the family would get all upset (laughs) because they weren't well off either give them to people and she, when she saw their suffering, she was so moved, she'd just start embracing them like a mother. And that's how she got the name Amma, means mother. Amma G is the noble mother. And she's known as the hugging saint now. She just goes around the world. She's hugged more than 33 million people <laughs> in 30 years. She does hug marathons. She'll just hug, hug. She mutters, she whispers things in your ear too. And often you don't even know what she said. <laughs> it could be a prayer or a mantra. I didn't understand what she muttered, but the hug was so delicious. So Amaji is like that, right? She she bestows the jinlap, the blessing waves. There are still beings in this world who can bless in that way. We can bless each other with our love, you know, with our, our care, our gifts of attention and affection and our it's kind our of energy words. i mean yeah, it's energy yeah yeah very powerful healing yes uh lucy hillenbrand wrote that sounds wonderful to hug so many <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, somebody asked her, do you really think you're saving the world by hugging everybody? She says, I'm not saving the world. I'm saving individ- I'm helping individuals feel more happy and whole. And that is how the world gets saved, you know, one person at a, at a time. Yeah, she's not claiming to be able to purify everybody's karma. And we all have to purify our own karma. Even the Buddha said that, you know. But that's how she sees it, one person at a time. Because one mind at a time, like hatred comes from someone's mind. The will to shoot, or like Putin, invade, came from his mind. So if we can transform minds, we can help to save the world. 
That's what she said. Yeah. Well, my friends. Stop if you want to, whatever, whenever. Okay. But, yeah. No, this feels like a good place to stop with Amaji. <laughs> okay. There's a beautiful footage of her I found of her hugging John Lewis, who passed away recently, right? Oh. Great senator. Uh, search that on YouTube, and it's easy to find John Lewis being hugged by Amaji. He was so touched and moved by her. He, he, I think he cried. It was such a beautiful moment. Yeah. Yeah. Amaji hugging John Lewis. He was a bodhisattva. He really was. And so is she. And we are too. We're bodhisattvas in training. <laughs> okay, my friends, have a beautiful evening. Wishing you well.